is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Yeah. Okay, members, um, we're in public session, and, and thank you for attending. If you can do, do the needful with electronic devices, um, and just keep them away from the mic so that they're not interfering. Um, the oral evidence session, if members are content um, with the Attorney General, will be he will be recorded um, reported by Hansard. Uh, if any member has any declaration of interest, um, now is the appropriate stage to do it. If not, uh, there's apologies to the meeting from Patsy McGlone and Emma Rogan. And if the clerk could indicate if anyone has delegated their vote under the appropriate standing order. Okay. Um, under standing order 1156, Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you. And just, just at the commencement of the, the meeting, uh, there were three of our members um, were advised by the police um, of threats being issued against them, Linda Dillon, Doug Beattie and Patsy McGlone. Um, and I just want to indicate publicly as chairman of the, co the committee um, my condemnation of that threat, um, my support for the members in carrying out their uh, responsibilities and duties. Um, they are all very much valued members of this committee that make significant contributions to it. Uh, and in exercising their democratic responsibility, uh, they should not uh, be having to do that under any form of threat at all, emanating from whatever source uh, that this is emanated from. Uh, and I, I want to condemn it unreservedly uh, and give my support to those members um, in respect of the threats that have been issued against them. Uh, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of everybody in the committee in expressing those uh, sentiments. If I can move on, um, there's the Linda. Linda. Just very quickly, just first of all to thank the chair for contacting me the other night whenever um, the news broke. I, I really appreciate it. appreciate the support actually from right across the board. I've had loads of support messages from everybody from every background and I really do appreciate it. So I just want to put that on record and also to put on record that I equally condemn the threats against everybody, all elected reps, including Doug, obviously, and, and, and Patsy, and I think Steve as well, um, and the journalists also who, who were threatened. And I think that's really where this started, and it's not acceptable. I don't always agree with what journalists say, but we have plenty of opportunities and plenty of platforms to challenge what, what journalists write or what journalists say, and they have a job to do, and they should be allowed to do it, free from any type of intimidation or threat. Very much so. Okay. Thank you. Um, moving swiftly on, um, if I can just jump on the agenda, because I want to, to go straight to the Attorney General in order to um, maximise the, the time that we have with him, because I know the Minister for Justice is giving a statement at half past one, um, and obviously we're, we're keen uh, to get into the Assembly. Uh, for that. So, can I uh, welcome the Attorney General for Northern Ireland, John Larkin QC, to the meeting? Um, it will be recorded by Hansard for members' information. The uh, COVID 19 regulations are on pages 97 to 146 um, of the uh, meeting pack, and I want to invite the Attorney General uh, to make some opening uh, remarks um, and then uh, members have been submitting some questions, um, which I know the AG's office has had some sight off, but I want to take members um, to ask those questions and allow the, the Attorney General then to respond to them. So, John, if you want to make some opening remarks, then I'll turn to members. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, well, very briefly, because I think the, the, the value of a session such as this really um, rests on the ability of members to, to ask questions. But uh, I'll make perhaps two, offer two general propositions. Uh, the first is that the present crisis, um, and it's not unique in this, can be taken to illustrate a proposition that merely doing what the law requires of us is not the same as acting as a good citizen uh, or as a good neighbour. And the second proposition is that while citizens can only be compelled to adhere to the law um, or punished if they do not adhere to the law's requirements, um, we can all be encouraged to go further than the law requires. And I think that's particularly important to emphasise the present time because we're rightly encouraged to, to stay at home. And the value of that in terms of protecting the NHS is, seems to me, obvious. But in terms of punishment and enforcement, 
um, the law does not always, as we shall see, insist on us uh, staying at home. Um, I'm going to make a, a general sort of caveat. Obviously, when I offer an interpretation um, of these regulations and discuss it with members, it's precisely that. It's an interpretation that's offered. It's not uh, binding. My interpretation don't have the, the force um, of law. I hope they're right, but I don't claim infallibility. And uh, they should be taken uh, in that way. And sometimes, of course, these regulations are difficult to interpret. And in that context, I commend uh, to all of the members of the committee the recent policy exchange paper by uh, Sir Stephen Laws, QC, a former first parliamentary counsel, um, who has produced an excellent paper uh, on legislating for relaxation of the lockdown. Now, whatever perspective one comes to these issues, whether one is uh, absolutist in terms of wanting very rigid enforcement or one wants pretty wholesale relaxation, Sir Stephen offers uh, an incredibly valuable analysis um, for, for whatever perspective one happens to bring to these issues. So I, I do commend that uh, to members. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll get into to one of the ones that have been most topical, and maybe it, it cuts across where you could have a Section 8 duty, um, and, and that related to the interpretation around what is essential travel. And obviously, there was at the start of this some difficulty around the placing and enforcement and, and who interprets what it is to carry out that essential journey. Um, and that covers a wide spectrum of context, whether it's business or indeed for leisure, which is the one that I think attracted the most public conversation about you know, what, what, how far is it and, and, and can you deem it essential to be travelling for that. So I suppose that the general question is the interpretation around what is essential travel and have you considered um, through Section 8 to provide guidance around that aspect to the PPS and the police service? Um. Well, I, I mentioned uh, Sir Stephen's uh, policy exchange paper already. I'll, I'll refer to it specifically. In paragraph 55, uh, he makes an observation. I won't do his observation justice because I'm not quoting exactly. And he says that a lot of the enforcement and interpretation issues would pose difficulties for justices of the Supreme Court, far less individual police officers on the ground in a busy park, for example, uh, trying to make uh, wise policing decisions. And uh, I think Sir Stephen is absolutely right to make that point. And he also adds, of course, it's one thing handling these issues in the cloistered atmosphere of a courtroom. It's quite another to be doing it under uh, operational pressures. Um, our Regulation 5 um, creates an offence in Regulation 5.1. And the offence is leaving uh, the place where one resides. I'll use the shorthand home, leaving one's home without reasonable excuse. Now, pausing there, the offence is created if one leaves home without reasonable excuse. Uh, recent amendments in Wales and England have provided for an additional offence, that is of being outside one's house without reasonable excuse. Uh, we don't have that. So there is only one way under Regulation 5.1 that an offence is committed. That is by leaving the home without reasonable excuse. Regulation 5.2 then sets out examples, because it's not exhaustive, in Regulation 5.2 A to M of what are taken to be reasonable excuses. Now, when one looks at those, I think it's reasonably clear that travel will be required for potentially almost all of those, perhaps all of them. Uh, so, for example, uh, moving house um, is unthinkable, really, without travelling. Um, but the only uh, explicit reference to travel is in relation to, to travel for work or for the uh, delivery of um, voluntary services. Um, so, um, on one view, um, one very strict view, 
that might be taken as that's the only context where travel can occur, but a common sense interpretation plainly must include travel for all of the specified reasonable excuses in 5.2a to m. Uh, and what that means is that, for example, if one is living in, in a skillen, but uh, attending a funeral of a close family member in Newcastle, one can, of course, travel from Enniskillen to Newcastle to attend that funeral. Uh, and that was also, I think, uh, before the recent amendment, the position in relation to travel for exercise. So if one um, wanted to uh, take necessary exercise in Newcastle, uh, one could travel from Enniskillen by car to take that exercise. There was no limitation uh, on the amount of travel uh, that one could engage in to take the exercise. Again, I emphasize, merely because one can do something lawfully is a very great distance from it being a socially desirable thing uh, necessarily to do that. But one could, before the recent amendment, have traveled from Enniskillen to Newcastle for the purpose of walking a stretch, for example, off the, the Ulster Way. Mm -hmm. um, the recent amendment has changed that, and therefore travel uh, will not be regarded, travel in order to exercise will not be regarded as constituting a reasonable excuse unless it is reasonable in all of the circumstances. Now, importantly, um, excluded from that limitation is travel that is itself exercise. So if one is, for example, a competitive swimmer with a particular training regime and one wants to swim in the sea, one can again go from Inneskillen to Port Ballantrae. Uh, by bicycle, um, and um, no matter how long that distance is, mm. if the long journey is itself a species of exercise, one can then engage in another form of exercise, swimming um, in, the, in the North Coast, mm -hmm. on that example. Okay. Um, and this is an area where um, it has occurred to me that Section 8 guidance could potentially be very useful. But of course, uh, as one knows, the regulations have uh, a built-in life of six months, um, and they may well uh, not exist in their present form within that time. So th there is an issue about the um, proportionality mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the helpfulness that such Section 8 guidance um, would actually afford concretely, bearing in mind, of course, that it's been my practice, as the committee knows, to consult not only as the statute requires with the Advocate General for Northern Ireland, but also to consult, to consult with any stakeholders and, of course, to consult importantly with this committee. Just a, a, a quick question on that. When, when I look at it, um, Regulation 5B, um, to exercise either alone or with other members of their household, in, in respect of actually the amount of exercise, and this goes back to your point, what may be legal and what may be socially responsible yes. can be in conflict. We don't have any current restriction to no. say that it should be only one no. form of exercise. So what England, what England is doing, they're, they're, they've moved, I think yesterday, unlimited period of exercise. That was always the case here. Strictly in terms of the construction of this regulation, yes, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, just on that point around travel associating uh, the members want to come in on that? Gordon? Yes, sir. Um, the point that, that has been exercised by a lot of people is this issue about travel to recycling centres. And um, a number of councils have opened, and other councils are waiting on clarification on the issue um, because they feel at the moment the travelling to a recycling centre is not essential travel. What's your opinion on that in relation to existing legislation? Well, the, the, uh, the dear minister has um, set out his position in relation to the importance of recycling. Um, and I think from a general environmental context, it would be very difficult to, to gain, say, anything that he has said uh, about the importance uh, of recycling. And therefore, if one looks at Regulation 5.2i, to access critical public services, 
including. Now, although certain public services are uh, specified there, the key concept is critical public services. So if one asks the question this way, is recycling a critical public service? Well, in the view of the, the Minister, um, it is. Um, as far as I'm aware, no one has seriously contended otherwise. So um, if one is accessing that critical public service, then it seems to me it's entirely proper that one travels um, to access it. Can, can I just follow up on that? Yes. Because it, it's an area I've engaged with the Dairy Minister on to try and distinguish in my own constituency one council is, but another part of the constituency a council hasn't, and it's on this key point that the interpretation the Minister has said that disposing of waste is a critical service, um, but because it doesn't say essential, there seems to be some confusion as to the interpretation of the language around what is essential and what is critical, uh, and therefore some councils are taking a different view as to, to how they interpret that. So your view then around what is deemed essential and what is deemed critical um, seems to be clear to me, um, but if, if I can just ask you again to define or try and distinguish what the difference would be between essential and critical. Well, the, the, that's a, a difficult question, Chairman, but the, the, I, I, I take um, Mr Justice Frankfurter's advice to law students, read the statute, read the statute, read the statute. So if one goes down 5 to I, it's to access critical public services. So um, if the minister, I don't have his paper before me, but if the minister has defined um, recycling as a critical public service, that's exactly the language used in Regulation 5 to. Um, and no one has, it seems to me, gainsaid the, the minister's due assessment. Uh, of recycling, and indeed in a larger environmental context, uh, one might suggest it would be very difficult uh, so to do. Uh, hence, someone who wishes to access recycling um, seems to me to be accessing a critical public service. And who, who would be the authority then on this? Because obviously people will seek opinions from various sources. Um, the Minister has provided guidance to councils around this aspect of it? Is it the departments that are responsible for interpreting and that's who people should go to? This is how you should interpret 5.2i and in this case it's deemed as critical so therefore take the department's lead on this? Well, the, the department, um, well, these are regulations made by the, um, the Minister for Health um, but in relation to an, a policy assessment of whether or not a particular um, function coming within the subject matter of another department should be judged by that department, then it seems to me that it's obvious that DERA should be the judge of whether or not recycling is a critical public service, with this caveat that, of course, the meaning of these regulations falls ultimately for judicial deter determination in the event of litigation on that subject. But, again, taking the matter both in terms of what 5.2i says and also common sense approach, if one dare say such a thing, that the Minister, in defining recycling as critical, seems to me to be going entirely with the green of a common sense interpretation. I know that's helpful. Gordon, sorry for interrupting you. I think, that's, you, know, I think you have answered it. The understanding I have is now that, that your interpretation is that recycling centres could reopen and the public could travel in a, in a sensible manner in a managed state. To, uh, to, the upper, to the sites? Yes, uh, and again, but I, I defer, obviously, because I don't possess the policy expertise that the Minister has at his disposal. So it, if the Minister determines that recycling, as he has done, yeah. is a, a critical public service, then um, it, it seems to follow that um, members of the public can, ought to be able to access uh, those critical public services. Thanks very much for that. Thanks, Chair. Paul? Yeah, thank you. This, this I, I suspect, will be a very helpful session. It has been even uh, so far. Uh, so, on, on the first issue that we talked about was the, you know, the, the essential and necessary, the critical. All these terminologies burst out. Uh, but it's very clear to me 
uh, that when this is all said and done, and we're looking back, that the experiment around draconian law just doesn't work. Um, and I think that's clear to me on a daily basis. Uh, and you're right, the only way you can test legislation is in a court. And the amount of pain that that will cause to get to that point will be immense uh, and will be much more detrimental than any imposition you put down on the people. I tend to hope and think that the people have moved to a sensible, responsible, safe position without this legislation. But, of course, it's hard to say. Uh, just, just on the necessary and the essential. It's, the essential. it's essential that I eat. Because if I don't eat, I'll die. But it's not actually necessary or essential that I go at a certain time of day or I, I go a number of times. You could, you could bring a, f a lorry load trailer of food and store it somewhere at your house. It's not necessarily necessary or essential that you take your recycling to a certain place. You could stockpile it in your backyard. It's not going to be very nice, but you could still do that. So it's the interpretation of the terminology that when you put these things, when you try and legislate for everybody's life and everybody's daily routines, you fall into all these traps and problems. There's a question here somewhere, but is that a fair assumption? Is that something you would agree with? Well, Chair, <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, um, Mr. Freeman, excuse me if I don't simply uh, give him a yes or no answer. <laughs> um, I think starting point in terms of the large issues, um, I think it's absolutely correct that law can't do everything for us. Um, and law fails very often when it tries to do much. Um, now, <clears throat> lots of statutes um, provide for the penalisation of X if one does X without reasonable excuse. Usually, what's reasonable excuse is left completely at large. So what happens is if someone is prosecuted for X, they raise evidentially what they say is a reasonable excuse. The function of a court in such a case is to determine whether or not X, whether or not the excuse is capable of being a reasonable excuse. And if it is, it's in the function of the prosecution to prove beyond reasonable doubt that it doesn't exist uh, in the circumstances, or it's not present uh, in the circumstances. Now, against that background, the structure here in 5.2 um, with his reference to need. Need here, it seems to me, doesn't impose a freestanding obligation to establish need for the various activities in A to M. The word need um, in it, the, the preface to A to M uh, is an acknowledgement by the legislator that these are pretty basic human needs. So there is the need to take exercise. Um, now, that's a, a human need, whether an individual happens to acknowledge or not, it or not, whether one is a, 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 an Olympic athlete or whether one is um, perhaps someone who needs exercise, maybe rather more than the, the Olympian. Um, and likewise, one doesn't get into um, food, or what is it, did you buy, uh, insert the name of biscuit of your choice, uh, could you have done without that particular item. Um, the law happily doesn't condescend to that level of intrusive detail. So if you're going shopping, um, and again, not criticising uh, law enforcement officers who are doing a difficult job in very novel circumstances, but it's no function of the police to, to peer into your shopping basket uh, and to approve or disapprove your choices. Okay, thank you. On, on the need aspect and human need, um, a lot of people have curtailed what they would regard as their fundamental human rights, you know, whether that's freedom of assembly, freedom of worship. We think about the fundamental rights to an education. All of these are being curtailed and voluntarily. I suppose the question, though, is at what point could somebody seek to challenge, based on EU convention rights, that there is a disproportionate restriction now by the state on what are fundamental rights? And, and where, where could that be something that 
somebody may decide to do or an organisation do? Well, I, I, I was struck um, whenever Mr. Frew was um, putting his question that um, when he referred to, to litigation uh, you know, as being um, you know, something calamitous, and of course in many ways socially litigation can be an ill, but it, it's not so for lawyers, so in one sense I'm, I'm almost um, a little bit surprised that um, there haven't been uh, litigation uh, challenges, and actually maybe it's a sign that the, the public in many ways has responded um, as uh, a body of good citizens, as a body of good neighbours, and isn't taking the legal points that, that undoubtedly can be conjured up in relation to any piece of legislation. Um, but yes, it, in terms of, of fundamental rights, um, the, the, right, uh, the rights protected under Articles 8, 9 and 10 are all engaged uh, in some way by these regulations. Um, and obviously the Minister for Health, whose primary responsibility it is, has made certain uh, necessary um, prefatory declarations in relation to the state of affairs in terms of health, public health that we're in, uh, that have been necessary in order for these to be made. Okay, thank you. Um, if I can just ask a question around, again, an issue that's related to local authorities. We're obviously, as members of this assembly, deemed it's an essential public service. We have a duty to be here. We're here, and we're facilitating them people to, to come in remotely. There's an issue emerging around local authorities that um, there is a view being taken that it is not regarded as an essential journey for a councillor to travel to a council building to participate in a council meeting. W what is the view on these regulations? Um, is that something that a councillor can be indicating that actually within the regulations this is covered? and therefore it is something that I have a democratic responsibility to exercise my duty, and that should be being accommodated by the local authority in the same way this assembly is accommodating members. Is that something that should be happening in local authorities? Well, um, I suppose the first thing to observe is that a, a, um, an elected councillor um, holds a public office, and therefore at common law certain obligations attach to the holder of a public office. And if a councillor, as a holder of public office, considers it her or his duty to uh, attend a council meeting, quite understandable if a councillor were to take that view, then the councillor may be regarded uh, pursuant to Regulation 5 to H as fulfilling a legal obligation. Uh, and therefore, it seems to me the focus must be on um, what the councillor is trying to do in substance rather than the travel, because the travel, uh, to an extent, is a little bit of a red herring. Um, if one is discharging the public function, just as, for example, if one is attending a funeral or if one is a minister of religion um, going to the church uh, where one is pastor, then it strikes me that, one, of course, one has to travel. Uh, and there is no limitation on the travel um, that one has to do in order to <coughs> discharge the substantive function. So it seems to me that um, whether the matter is viewed as another reasonable excuse not falling within the specified 8M or, uh, as it seems to me, uh, possible under 5 to H, that one is, as a public official, necessarily discharging the duties of that station then travel in order to discharge those duties seems to me to fit comfortably within that. that that's helpful. Can I ask, has any local authority sought advice from you in respect of the interpretation of these regs? No, um, and, and, and that might not be um, particularly extraordinary. Obviously, uh, as, as this committee will know in particular, um, my primary function in terms of giving advice is of giving advice to the executive. But it's been absolutely clear during the almost 10 years now that I've been discharging this function 
that individual MLAs, uh, members of parliament um, and other public figures can write. Now, it may not be appropriate for me to um, answer their questions, but when it is, particularly when those questions give rise to issues of general public importance, then I will try to, to answer their questions. No, well, I think that would be helpful you know, because there is a lot of public bodies probably struggling, um, but local authorities seem to be one in particular. Um, and, and knowing that they can at least seek advice, um, whether that is provided or not is something obviously you can determine. But if the door is open for it the is. ask to be made, it is. then that, I think that is something that would be beneficial to other elected members um, to, to avail of. So, yeah, uh, I would be happy to, to give that indication, Chairman. Um, in terms of the step-by-step um, -step process that the Executive has announced, um, and obviously we are looking at you know, step one in respect of whether it is leisure or community, family, and, and it is all broken down into these various different sectors. Um, going forward, as, as, as I think we recognise, it is very difficult to legislate a way out. Um, because you require social responsibility to often do more than what the law requires, and the law is often there to capture those that just refuse to, to go with the mainstream on these things. But to, to move into step one of whatever sector, will that require a continual updating of the regulations to have it clearly defined that this is now permissible? In respect of step one and then two and three, and should we be anticipating that there is going to be a vast amount of regulations coming forward to implement all of these various stages? Well, as um, your question uh, rightly suggests, Chairman, the, uh, the five step um, policy is a policy, um, it is a direction of travel, it is not itself uh, a change in the law, it is not itself the law. Obviously, a commitment by the executive binding on uh, on ministers um, as a commitment by the executive. Um, so it's likely either that it will require uh, amendment, or indeed perhaps the gradual removal uh, as as obligations uh, cease to be necessary. So uh, it, it may be that we will see not more regulation, but um, quantitatively less regulation. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it in the, in the sense of removing, because I'm trying to, to picture in my mind how you legislate for every possible scenario. You know, and often you need to provide a general framework, and, and you fit within that, and and, um, and the removal of a regulation. I can see how that would allow it. Well, you go back to what it was, and here's the legal framework as it was around responsibility of health and safety and so on. Um, or, or indeed, it, as you suggest, it may sometimes require more because if one is trying to kind of specify uh, with greater particularity, um, then you have a bit more ink on the page uh, rather than less. Okay. I just jump yes, Dick. I mean, I, I mean, that's, uh, John. Thank you. I mean, you're always you're always gracious with with uh, outloading what, what you're thinking, uh, and I thank you for that. But that's an interesting point. I think you've just raised because as we start to go through that unlock, if we start taking out any regulations or easing regulations and, and, and doing it in a physical way with, with, our, with our written sort of documentation. But then if we have to take a step back again, if we have to then go back the other way, then we have to reimpose the regulation. So uh, do we need something that is a, a regulation which is flexible and agile so that people are, and I think you've alluded to it, I mean, everything we're doing now is, is, is like policing by consent. But we need an agile regulation as opposed to taking stuff out of it or adding stuff to it. Well, well yes, uh, and obviously the, the technical difficulties in all of that can't be underestimated, and that's why I go back to uh, Sir Stephen Law's paper. Uh, he makes um, a, a critique um, of some aspects of the English regulations, but he's very quick to point out, as a, as a supremely experienced and skilled drafter. Um, his admiration for those who were able to put this together in a remarkably short time. Um, and it is perhaps, back to the issue about litigation, it's perhaps a tribute, when all is said and done, to these regulations um, as they emerge, as they're touched on, as they develop, that there hasn't been um, a great 
wave of legal controversy um, ending up in the courts um, as a result of them. And, and can I just add, though, just on that last point, I, I mean, I always get a sense that, that the court piece doesn't normally kick in until it's, it's all quietened down and it's all gone and we're all back to some, some sort of state of normality. So is there a feeling that litigation in regards to everything that we're going through now may well kick in after this crisis is finished? Well, of course, the, the, that's the beauty of uh, policing by consent. So if, for example, a police officer makes a suggestion, perhaps would you mind moving on and the members of the public move on, um, it, it may be that in some very strict analysis the police officer uh, ought not to have imposed that condition. But if, as a suggestion, it's complied with, then it, it doesn't really matter what the formal legalities are some six months or 12 months down the line. Thank you. Just to tease that out, in, in the aspect of the public gathering currently, 6A, it's, well, Reg 6 is that no more than two people. Yes. In a, in a public place can gather unless you're in the same household and so on. So if you were to move that to 10, you couldn't withdraw that. You would need to amend it to say right. the 10 figure, for example. That's right. Okay. Or uh, if one decided that that wasn't an issue anymore uh, and could be dealt with simply by um, encouragement, um, then Regulation 6 would vanish in its entirety. Mm -hmm. So th th there are one approach is to amend uh, mm -hmm. to provide, uh, and in many ways that's helpful because we can look and see, ah, that's what I must do, uh, that's what I can do, um, or one can um, simply uh, remove in its entirety if one, as hopefully we will, reach that stage when that becomes appropriate. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Um, Paul. You had an issue around access for children in this current. Um, yes, I, I did have. Uh, the, there seems to be a growing issue in constituency level, and I'm sure all MLAs are getting it, whereby the relationship breakdown between two parents with a shared access to, to a child, and uh, that relationship has become even more fraught to the point where there is no access, maybe arrangements that had been facing beforehand are now just tossed up into the air. Uh, and because hostilities have started, then there's been a blanket ban. And people's only redress out of that is court. When, whenever, whenever you can't reason with on an unreasonable person, then you have no other option but to go through the court process, which is hard as it is, uh, for families in the family setting. Uh, the Lord Chief Justice seems to have the role here and the responsibility as to court procedures, and I get that and I accept that 100%. But in your role, do you have any discussions uh, with the Lord Chief Justice around this? And is there a conversation being had at present as to when? Now, I know there are, are court set, courts taking place, procedures taking place, but it seems to be not a great deal uh, in what is a very slow process in normal times. Uh, have you any thoughts on this? And, and, there's, and is there any conversation ongoing as to when we'll be able to see more activity in our courts to allow parents to gain access to children? Uh, some people are going up the walls, they really are. It's a very emotive issue, very pressurised. Um, it is, uh, and obviously, um Family law, uh, at the best of times, is uh, a hugely sensitive and emotionally charged um, discipline. I suppose it's really important to to keep um, the, the the issue of COVID nineteen um, health protection regulation separate, um, because the, the provision in Regulation 5.2 providing for the continuation of access arrangements um, is simply a common sense acknowledgement that it's important for, by and large, parents to have contact, sorry, children have contact with their parents. Um, but if there are reasons, um, perhaps following um, litigation, why it's important that um, a particular child doesn't have um, 
unsupervised access uh, with uh, one of her or his parents, then the COVID-19 regulations don't really sound on that. If, for example, there's an issue that of access to the court um, and that there is evidence that a child is suffering because of the inability to, to see one or other parent, then I'm quite sure that lawyers properly acting for such a client uh, will notify the court, if necessary, will, will notify the Office of the Lord Chief Justice and ask for arrangements to be made for an urgent hearing when the usual conditions for an urgent hearing um, exist. Linda? My point is just on the, on the same issue, that's just why I wanted to come in now, Chair. Um, just on the, on the back, my understanding, what I have been saying to families who have asked for my advice, my understanding of the guidelines is that where there is co-parenting, where a child is moving between two homes, that two homes are treated as one unit for the purposes of COVID. So if one home, if there are symptoms within one house, then both households have to behave as though they're one. So they both self-isolate for 14 days. And that is the, the advice that I've been given, and it has been helpful in some cases. But in other cases, parents are actually using it, you know, somebody in this house has symptoms, so therefore I'm not allowing the child to go to your house, or I believe somebody in your house has symptoms, therefore I'm not allowing the child to go to your house. And the advice that they're being given very often, um, and I'm not sure that the, it, my view would be the advice is wrong, but I don't know and whether it's a, it's a problem within the court system or within the, the legal advice that they're being given. is. The parents are, are, are not being able to access the judicial system in those cases to be able to get access to their child. And one parent actually was told that the only circumstance under which you would get an urgent hearing is the circumstance under which a child is in danger. So therefore, if you could prove that the child is in danger in the home with the parent that they're with. But you've just said yourself that a child, that could also be interpreted a child being in danger is a child being prohibited from seeing one or other parent. That's that's not good for that child. It's not good for their mental health. It's not good for for the relationship between the, the parent and the child. So I'm just looking for a wee bit more clarification around that in terms of because like Paul, I'm getting quite a few um, constituents coming to me in relation to this because they're having difficulty getting any advice anywhere else. Um, so they're coming to us as a last well, resort. Um, I can only give them the guidance that, that's out there, but the actual legalities of it is a, an entirely different manner. Well, there's always the risk, of course, of uh, at this remove, uh, 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 and it's, it's a rule that I won't take up of being the hurler on the ditch, sort of saying, Here, yeah. here's what you do. Um, but in, in, in general terms, um, and human nature being what it is, of, of course, um, th there will be exploitation. Um, of this crisis in, in all kinds of areas. That, 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 that's inescapable, I regret to say. In the particular context of where um, parent A um, thinks that parent B is um, pulling a fast one in relation to the existence of temperature in one household as opposed to the other. Unfortunately, that's simply um, one of those things, and really not too much can be done about that. If, however, um, the particular quarantine period, the 14 days, has elapsed um, and the is still uh, being uttered, well then, of course, um, th there may be something that can be done about that. The issue is, is this child suffering? Because uh, not only under our um, children's order, but under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, in um, all of these things, the best interest of the child has to be uh, a primary consideration. Uh, and therefore, if there is evidence that a child is suffering, and it needn't be that a child is in danger of real physical harm, but if there is, and, and one can imagine this, if there is evidence that could be properly uh, put before the courts, look, this child is suffering um, and may sustain um, emotional damage. It's affecting performance at school in terms of home learning. It's one parent helps with maths, uh, falling behind, or whatever. 
then. That is something which I am quite sure the courts will take into account, uh, firstly in deciding whether or not to list, um, to see whether um, this is a case that needs adjudication at this time. Um, of course, very often it is the old line, if you, if you do not ask, you will get. Uh, and I suspect that what may be happening is people are not asking, um, and uh, lawyers on behalf of clients uh, should ask, um, and indeed the clients should ask the lawyers um, in a proper case where there are genuine concerns about child welfare in the largest sense, um, and that includes the, the avoidance of emotional in these circumstances. Okay. Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, uh, Gordon, you had a couple of questions um, around funerals, crematoriums, yeah. businesses, around hairdressers, and so on. And it, I suppose, it, in a general sense, there is issues being raised from businesses about when they can reopen and, and, and so on. And, and maybe if we spent a little bit of time just talking about the regulations in the context of business activity, Gordon. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Just a couple of issues in relation to attendance at funerals. There have been other couple of funerals recently, in fact one today. Uh, would you agree that there is need for further clarification on the numbers that can attend funerals? Um, the police uh, seem to be fairly firm on the number of ten in relation to family funerals, which uh, sadly have happened over over the past few weeks. Um, there is some of a grey area about whether the public can say stand on the street outside the funeral parlour in a, in a proper social distancing manner, which is, from my evidence has been the case. I think that is um, an area that needs some clarification and sort of uh, direction police would tend to now contact them, pushes down the line, it's 10, 10 only. And there's this misunderstanding, perhaps I would put it in brackets, that people cannot attend or be seen almost at a funeral uh, in only large numbers and stand in a social distancing manner in, in the street, say, outside the, the funeral parlour. Just like your thoughts on that. Um, the other issue that has been brought to my attention this week is about attendance at the crematorium. I have had one lady, a local lady in my constituency, very annoyed that a relative is unable to attend the chapel or at, during the process, if you want, in, within, at the crematorium. I have not done some research on it, and um, I understand the City Council are fairly strict on it. Uh, because there are a number of issues, obviously, in relation to the health and safety of employees, etc., which we all understand. But I do think, and we all appreciate Northern Ireland funerals are a very sensitive issue, and I th we have a high regard for the dead and respect for the dead, which is commendable, and it's one of the great positives of this place. And uh, but I do think it's time to perhaps review it. Um, uh, and I think it's maybe designed and put in place for the extreme conditions, which we're all thankful to God it didn't happen. And I think those issues perhaps need some some review and amendment going forward. But I would like your thoughts and appreciate it, it's your interpretation on uh, the numbers at funerals and the crematorium issue. Uh, well, as we. Let, let me separate um, two things. One, the question of um, a review of the regulations, and obviously that will be a matter for um, ministers. The second issue is uh, what is currently in the regulations. And of course, the um, provisions about um, funerals uh, are um, twofold. So there is a reference to uh, funerals in 5.2.G, so one of the specified reasonable excuses for being outside the home is to attend a funeral of a member of the person's household, close family member 
or uh, if no one within subparagraphs one or two is attending, that is, if there's no member of the household, uh, no close family member, uh, a friend, uh, that, that's obviously in the case of so, so that no one um, is buried um, alone, if there's no family member, uh, 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 friends um, can attend. Um, and of course, there is no um, numerical limitation um, in 5.2.G. So if one um, came from a very large family, lots of brothers and sisters, um, they could all attend um, sister, for example. Um, separately, the issue of um, control of gatherings is dealt with in Regulation 6. And the main prohibition there is on participating in a gathering of more than two people. And then among the exceptions that are to uh, attend a funeral. Now, interestingly, it, it's, um, it's not linked back to um, the categories in Regulation 5.2.G, but a common sense interpretation of the, the regulations as a whole is really that um, they should be read harmoniously. Um, and this is a, an area where I think um, the number of 10 is simply a rule of thumb. You won't find that figure of 10 in the regulations. Uh, the issue will be if you're standing um, spaced out um, from someone uh, are you participating in a gathering? Of course, the, the other side of that coin is, well, why are you here? Why are you in this location? And the answer might be, well, I've, I've gathered together with other members of the community to pay my respects mm. at the occasion of the funeral of Mr. Brown across the street. Um, so uh, I'm afraid there are no easy answers in relation to that. And in relation to the um, crematorium, um, Obviously, there, what matters is that the premises are not physically open. Uh, hence, the person you describe can't access um, the, the chapel of remembrance in that particular context. So, you know, that will be something um, I suspect much more for review than for present interpretation. Okay, just. So, is it true to say that a, a large family could go into the graveyard, uh, and that's that's reasonable to do? Yes, it is. More than ten. Uh, if, for example, and and, and there are um, large families. So, if the uh, you're talking about close family member, so let's say one had um, fifteen um, siblings. And, and, and there are, of course, uh, families here of that size. Um, and, and one of one's brothers or sisters died. Could the other 14 attend the funeral? Yes, <coughs> they do. And the other issue is just about the public in the street uh, in a proper manner is a reasonable thing to do. Well, the. the then I think one might be moving into the territory of unspecified reasonable excuse. So if, for example, a police officer came along and said, look, I know you're all spaced out, but there are 20 of you here um, you know, in this particular street. <coughs> I think if someone said, look, I've been a neighbour of Mrs. Brown's for the mm. last 50 years, um, and um, she's a very small family, and I want her family to appreciate that this street is um, solidarity with them and their great bereavement. I would hope that um, sensible enforcement would uh, permit that if suitable social distancing uh, was present. And if they were to proceed down the street after the cortege in a anti -so <laughs> social distancing manner, would that be unauthorised? 
Well, it broke the legal. The, 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 there are separate provisions, of course, in relation to parades and legislation, so mm. that's a different issue. But it, it, once that starts to happen, then um, I think the risk might be, um, from the perspective um, of those who are concerned about this, as we all must be, that it then becomes harder. It's one thing to remain stationary and preserve a distance, but when you start to walk, yeah. um, the, the, the cultural habits of centuries will start to kick and uh, uh, see the risk that there will be um, you know, a closer gathering. So um, I would hope that uh, the police would be um, sensitive to persons standing still to pay their respects, perhaps in a street context, even if the numbers uh, you know, were in excess of, of 10, for example, uh, though that number is nowhere specified in these regulations. It's not but specified? No. It's not? Uh, I mean, and that's back to the example of the family. So if yeah. you have a family of 14 brothers and sisters, yeah. Uh, yeah. that's fine. Is it that that figure much. of 10 Thanks, has been repeated extensively? Only 10? And I, I, I've dealt with families yeah. to say, sorry, which one of my brothers is not going? Well, um, so if it's not in the regulations... Close, close family members uh, is the term used in 5.2.G. Uh, I, I see, um, as always, I speak subject to correction, uh, I see no uh, upper limit mm -hmm. in uh, 5.2.G. Uh, and should 6... C expressly connect back to to the regulation in five related to funerals. Well, I, I think the regulations have to be read harmoniously. So the the implication will be that it's the, the people it's the people who should be attending in the first place, mm -hmm. uh, and that that's the group specified in regulation five two G. Okay. Okay. Um, Linda. Um. Sorry, <coughs> excuse me. Just in relation to the proposed con contact tracing app, do you have any views on that in r relation to possible <laughs> human rights <laughs> well, issues and privacy? And I, I, I laugh because um, if I were to take out my mobile phone, um, uh, which is a, a, an antique, you would realise <laughs> that this is terribly, that's entirely foreign <laughs> to me. Uh, so. Um, I'm very happy to look at the issue mm -hmm. uh, and have a think about it, but um, I, I have to uh, say in all candour that nothing I could say now would be of any use whatsoever. It's safe to say in this very general sense. Obviously, uh, we, we, we live in an era uh, where commercial entities um, have uh, access to data about us, um, including sensitive data about us, that would have been unimaginable in, in previous decades. Um, and, and the state um, also has access to a vast amount of data about us. And there are, in, in a general sense, always concerns about the proper use of data. And there are existing protections, as, as the committee knows, in relation to uh, personal data. But um, in relation to the specific uh, contact tracing app, I'm afraid I'll be of no I use asked whatsoever. the question on the basis that I am I'm very much um, like yourself. I'm Linda not dot com, yes. so I, I'm not. You know, I wouldn't be aware of all the issues around it, but I have been lobbied, actually, in relation to the issue already, and and I am aware that um, in other countries where it has been introduced, there doesn't seem to be a any great uptake of it. So, I'm just trying to inform myself in relation to the, the issue, but thank you. But, but it's an issue certainly that I'm happy to, to look at if, if the committee wishes. Well, um, John, uh, vul vulnerable people, and I think that I just can't put my finger on the, the reg, but it defines a vulnerable person here. Um, one of them is those that are 70 and over. Um, and I've had increasing correspondence from people in that age category, which all of the evidence shows are more susceptible and, and can have fatal consequences. Um, but there are those in that category concerned at being treated uh, wholesale who say, I'm in good health and I don't want to have specific age application here that, that is going to curtail my freedoms, which may well be relaxed for those below that threshold. What's the view there on how that's going to interface? Obviously, there's age discrimination legislation and so on. So go going forward, 
how do regulations need to be framed in a way that doesn't just issue a blanket if you're over the age of 70, you're under more severe restrictions? Well, th that'll be a challenge going forward. Um, and again, I, I do, um, perhaps for the third time, commend uh, Sir Stephen Law's uh, paper generally in this context. Uh, what I would draw particular attention to, I suppose, is um, Article 14 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, Article 14, of course, uh, as the committee know, isn't freestanding, so it's, it's acts in combination with one of the other substantive or more substantive uh, provisions of the conventions. Classically, in this context, it will be uh, Article 8 uh, or Article 9 or Article 10. And um, there will be, uh, there will have to be, uh, going forward, an analysis of whether um, any change imposes um, some excessive or disproportionate burden um, on persons who, over the age of 70, uh, or over any age for that matter, um, are perfectly healthy, capable of enjoying life. Is there, will there be a proportionate reason for imposing restrictions on them which are no longer applied to the rest of us? So, Again, the, the, as so often, um, what will matter will be the text going forward. Um, but I'm, I'm quite sure the department um, are aware of the sensitivities um, mm -hmm. in this area and uh, will take appropriate care in drafting any relaxation or rather in, in drafting relaxation provisions that are only partially relaxing uh, and which continue to impose uh, restrictions on um, our older citizens. Well, one of the areas where we've debated this around travel has been um, an elderly relative at home and for their mental well-being going and visiting them if it's in their garden socially distanced or looking through the window. Is that permissible in these regulations that you can decide I'm going to visit because I believe that's necessary for the greater welfare of, of that individual? Well, I think um, if one looks at Regulation 5, and again I make the, the general point that uh, although um, 528 um, specifies certain reasonable excuses, um, they are examples. Uh, they are carved out specified examples, and it's not exhaustive. But even within that, if one looks at um, 5.2.D, uh, to provide care or assistance, including relevant personal care within the meaning of um, or to provide emergency assistance. So emergency assistance is um, at large. If one looks at F, um, to provide voluntary or charitable services, where it's not reasonably personal for the person uh, to work, provide those services from the place where they are living. So if you're providing a, a charitable service uh, and one remembers the uh, origins, the etymological origins of the word charitable. It's about love. Um, so one might see that uh, could one invoke that provision in order to provide some necessary care, um, necessary in the largest sense, care to an elderly family member by preserving uh, social distancing, uh, but letting them see a face that they hadn't seen for, for some time. I think it would be a very um, hyper strict interpretation of these regulations to conclude that that wasn't possible, either under the general reasonable excuse provision or indeed coming within some of these um, provisions. So, um, because that, that an example has been given, um, your child has autism, and you're just struggling to contain in that environment, and therefore one of the ways that it has assisted is to go on a car journey. Well, I, I think um, that's, that, that example, I think, is plainly addressed by um, M, 5-2-M. So, to avoid injury or illness or to escape a risk of harm. Mm. Now, that's, I think, primarily mm. designed for the domestic abuse situation. But, of course, it's not confined to that. So, if a parent responsibly takes the view, my child 
with autism mm -hmm. is, is going to be damaged if we don't leave the house. And remember, it's the, 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 the offences committed or not when one leaves the house. It's not being outside the house as it is in England and Wales. So to get into a car to essentially um, relieve some unbearable tension on an autistic child seems to be uh, entirely proper um, and within these regulations. Because it's that then uh, interpretation of it, <coughs> if you're stopped, yes. uh, as a number of us have, myself included, what's your journey you relate to? It's at that point when you're explaining to an officer, because I needed to because my child was climbing up the walls and you know the atmosphere was getting very difficult and, and this was a way to relieve that. And that then isn't taken as 5-2 AM allows for that or you know, some other regulation that, that captures that or the, the visit to the garden and your relatives there because it's for their welfare. Well, you determine it's your subjective view that that welfare required you to carry out that visit. But Officer X, that, that, that isn't serious enough. So I don't accept that. Here's your penalty notice. Go back home. And one hopes that um, that has never happened, um, but there is, I suppose, anecdotal evidence that um, something like it has happened um, up to the point where the uh, refusal of the reasonable excuse has occurred and the, the parent has returned home. Mm. So uh, outside of the enforceability of it, though, the regulations create a culture. And, and what you have then is almost a, a shaming. If you step outside the house, it may never lead to a complaint to the police or, or a, a prosecution, but there is a, a, a kind of, I'm actually not going to visit my granny because if my neighbour sees me, even though I think I need to, it's going to be, you're putting the public at risk. And so there's a cultural shaming of people not to do things that actually is permissible under these regulations. So the regulations are intuitive. To how society is going to deal with this. Well, they are, uh, but that's why I, I, I began with the notion of good citizens and good neighbours. Um, and it, it's not um, the the act of a good citizen or good neighbour to turn this place into Hawthorne's evocation of 17th century New England, where there's an equivalent of the Scarlet Letter, um, if people act responsibly. And I think that um, good citizens and good neighbours would be only too supportive of stressed parents who bring their autistic children for the necessary spin in the car. And the law, um, you know, back to Mr. Frew's point, I mean, the law is at its best when it goes with the grain of common sense in particular communities. And um, sometimes the law. Uh, reaches outcomes which don't, in the view of many of us, correspond from time to time with common sense. But usually the law does reach fairly common sense solutions. And I would be astonished uh, if a court were to conclude that a parent responding to the pressures of an autistic child's need for space and a change of scene um, couldn't lawfully take that child as they and their sensible judgment required. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. I had a question just following on from Linda's just about the contact tracing app. Um, I'm just this is very specific, but have you provided or been asked to provide any guidance uh, or advice on the development of such an app to the executive? Well, um, two things in relation to my Section 8 guidance, um, which is as you know, under the 2004 Act uh, and its guidance on international human rights standards addressed to criminal justice organisations, I have not that currently in contemplation, largely for the reasons uh, explored with the, the Deputy Chair. Um, there's also a convention that, um, in relation to giving advice, that uh, neither the advice itself is ever disclosed nor the fact uh, as to whether it's been sought or not. That's a long-standing convention in relation to law officers. I have another question, but I'll let other members continue with theirs because I know there's another list. It's okay. Gemma? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just have a question around the regulations and 
um, the use of hotels for domestic violence victims. Um, you mentioned there about having to escape to leave the house to escape a risk of harm. Um, so how what how would the regulations stand um, if someone needed to go to a hotel for um, emergency accommodation? Absolutely no trouble at all. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if premises are available mm -hmm. of whatever kind, uh, remember the, the offence under Regulation 5 is being leaving your home yeah. without reasonable excuse. So um, once you leave to protect yourself from harm, you can stay somewhere else um, in perfect legality. As, even though the hotels are meant to be closed? Uh, but if the hotel provides accommodation uh -huh. for victims of domestic abuse, um, then it, it's discharging an absolutely necessary function, in my view. Okay. And then in terms of um, the regulations on the temporary or, or early release of prisoners, um, how does that stand up? Is that within, within the regulations? I, I see nothing in these regulations uh, about that. That would be addressed separately. There's a provision, as you know, in prison rules providing mm -hmm. for uh, early release, yeah. but that's at the election of the governor or prison service mm -hmm. um, but that's that'll be exercised no doubt having regard to all kinds of considerations and the present <coughs> health emergency is no other factor but that's not addressed in these particular sets of regulations okay thank you thanks the, the hotel scenario Gemma alluded to that, I take it that's then the defense for the hotel if someone came and went sorry person X is staying here yes then they, they can point to yes but person X availed of regulation 5m. And, and, and I think one knows anecdotally, and for my part, I'm delighted to hear it, that um, hotels have been providing accommodation also for um, NHS uh, employees um, to help shield their families um, from the risk attendant upon their, their work. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's absolutely right that that should happen, it seems to me. Before I forget, Pat Patsy had a, a question, John. Um, I'll just read it. In application of the COVID-19 regulations, what responsibility has the executive and each individual department to ensure that its decision or decisions do not intensify serious risk to health and safety of the community, including within the workplace? Well, these regulations are addressed, I suppose, to us all as citizens. They don't um, neither the original regulations nor their amendment impose any additional obligations on uh, ministers or the executive as such. Okay. Rachel. Um, thank you. On Tuesday, as you'll be aware, the roadmap document was published by the Executive Office and announced in the Chamber by the First and Deputy First Minister. I had raised an issue over safe workplaces for those who are required to return to work. I'm hoping to gain some clarification on the legal duty um, of employers to provide safe workplaces in the context of, of the regulations and the restrictions requiring of social distancing within those regulations. First Minister had stated that ultimately it would be the executive's responsibility. I'm just wondering if that is, is something that you could comment on. Uh, no, because it falls outside these regulations, so it's not really something which um, I think I can comment on today. If, if I specify um, or make specific rather uh, the general point uh, I made earlier, if you, you have a, a query, uh, a detailed query about that and uh, for any member of the committee and wish to, to write to me about it, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a more considered answer. Yeah. Linda? Just in relation, it's, it's a bit of a follow-on just from the Chair's um, questions around, obviously, what is re reasonable and what is considered reasonable. And I think, to be fair, for the most part, common sense has been applied. And I think that if, if as much common sense was applied in all other matters, we would be in a good place. Is it your view that, if, for the most part, that that common sense has been applied in terms of the PS9 because I know that even Alan Todd had come out for quite early in the process and, and actually talked about that very specific circumstance where you had a child, for example, who had autism and, and that child needed to get out of the house as part of their routine. Because routine is so important that that would be seen as essential. In your observations of, of how the regulations have been applied, and particularly in relation to the PS now, because obviously, for the most part, they're the people that are going to be called on to 
and 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 some of it by exactly what Paul has mm-hmm. has raised around the the almost shaming of mm-hmm. people for leaving their home for per- perfectly legitimate reasons. Um, is it has it been your observation that PS Night, for the most part, obviously you can't say in absolutely every case, but for the most part have have applied the regulations in a common sense manner, and in a way that has helped the public actually to work with the guidelines rather than against them? Uh, tough one. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tough question, I suppose, in two ways. One, because it, it um, assumes that I have a perhaps greater knowledge of police operation on the ground than I in fact do. And the other, because it, it's not at all clear how the, the issues have always been approached. And, and again, I, 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 I think that Sir Stephen Laws is absolutely right. Um, many of the issues are issues that would be tough for Supreme Court justice to handle in the rarefied atmosphere of a courtroom. And um, I'm not sure that uh, correct interpretations have always been given by everyone in relation to this area, but I, I, I don't think it's perhaps helpful to, to focus on perhaps the approach that was taken uh, in the past. I, I think that now, and in particular with the, uh, the amendment which um, imposes a, a reasonableness condition in relation to travel for exercise, that I think that um, everyone is pretty much on the same page now. Um, and I'd be pretty confident um, of that. And, and that's bearing in mind the limitations in terms of what I, what I see mm-hmm. um, and, and, and what I hear anecdotally. Um, and I think that's, I, mean, I also think that, for example, the, the, um, the media have done, um, on one hand, a very good job in relation to drawing attention to, to some of these issues. You know, many of us will have heard of some of the issues around um, through the work of journalists. But at the same time, sometimes there is a, a tendency um, for uh, stories to uh, exist or come into being because of, oh, well, uh, she says that he's doing a bad job and he says that he's got this wrong, rather than focusing on actually trying to deliver the best possible service. So that's why I suppose while I enormously um, applaud uh, the kind of work that's been done uh, exposing difficulties in enforcement, I think what we need to do now is um, keep on the pretty good path that we appear presently to be on. Thank you. Okay, Gordon. Thanks, Chair. I think my last question is just in relation to management and regulation of business premises. Um, on the Economy Committee, this has come up uh, in relation to businesses such as Hairdressers, beauty parlours, sunbed um, studios. I understand in some areas of the province, premises like that have opened, and there's difficulty in who actually has the authority to close them. And uh, I'm fully aware that the environmental health of local government has a responsibility, and the health and safety executive have responsibility. But my understanding is both are, push, are highlighting the regulations and the, the necessary legislation, but no one seems to have the authority, is my understanding, to close such premises. What's your understanding or your opinion well, on that? I suppose the key concept is the, the relevant person um, under the regulations. And as I understand matters at present, the only relevant person is constable. Uh, so there the matter rests now but that of course could change there may be a specification of other relevant persons um, but by analogy with the issue um, in relation to access and contact we already have an existing um, substratum of health and safety law as well as these regulations so um, Activity that is dangerous, um, that doesn't provide a safe system of work um, for employees, will already be unlawful in terms of our existing substratum 
of uh, health and safety regulation. Additional powers are contained uh, in these regulations, but right now the only uh, specified relevant person is a police officer. They have the ultimate authority? Well, they are the ones who can give the um, who are able to able to invoke the enforcement requirements in um, seven regulation seven. If some of the business wasn't complying with the necessary health and safety, and that would be a matter for the health and safety executive. See, the the, the, the relevant person is charged with the enforcement of um, these regulations. Um, the, that's why I point to the existing substratum of health and safety regulation, where it would be the, the relevant enforcement body who already exists. In many cases, it would be the health and safety executive. Yeah, we've sort of been there, and I suppose there is a reluctance. And I think one of the factors is who's responsible for loss of earnings. You know, and I think that's perhaps an issue that leaves it and leaves it in a grey situation. So where I think your, your bottom line is the police have the have the authority as it exists. Under under these regulations, uh, a constable is a relevant person um, for the purpose of these regulations. But obviously, uh, a police officer doesn't have general <coughs> specialist uh, enforcement capability in relation to the purview of the health and safety executive, for example. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, John. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Anybody else? Any final questions? No. John, can I thank you? Because I, I think that's been very helpful um, for members to be given that oversight. Um, and it, like all these things, will will raise more questions. But it's informative as to how we try and move forward. Um, and, and there's certainly been plenty there that I think will be hugely beneficial to us. So. My appreciation for making yourself available to the committee, yeah. as always. It's, it's a pleasure, Chair, and, and I repeat again that I'm um, very happy to respond to um, queries from, obviously, members of the committee, the committee corporately, uh, and other public representatives, uh, if that's helpful. Um, sometimes we get queries which are, um, you know, can I get planning permission for my pigeon loft? Well. Let me be upfront. I'm not going to answer that question, yeah. but uh, questions of general public importance, I, I will certainly try and answer. I, I very much appreciate that. So thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, now. Okay, members. Um, let me try and, and get through the rest of the business as, as quickly as we can, um, bearing in mind the the plane raise and half on. No time for it. Yeah, I'll go back. Okay, the, the draft minutes from the previous meeting um, of the 30th of April. If members are content that they're a true reflection, then if I can sign them accordingly, unless there's any corrections. Members content? Content. Matters arising. Uh, members, there's uh, a letter was received from the Minister for Justice in respect of the debate that was held on the uh, budget, 2020 21 budget. Um, members, we've had a, a discussion around that, and that will be actioned, and a draft response will be uh, prepared and circulated around uh, members, and then we will issue that uh, to the Minister in response to that. Item two. Um, for matters arising, there is a response from the Minister for Justice on supervised access arrangements. Um, at our meeting on the 23rd of April, the Committee considered a response from the Minister regarding the provision of clear guidance on supervised access arrangements during the COVID-19 situation and agreed to request further information on how the guidance would be brought to the attention of parents and individuals. The Minister has indicated to the Lord Chancellor that she does not consider these uh, provisions should be applied retrospectively within Northern Ireland. Um, Apologies. The Minister has responded outlining the actions have been taken, including a joint statement from the Minister for Health, highlighting key aspects of guidance and detailing where further information can be obtained, and also added to the Northern Ireland Direct uh, web pages and highlighted more uh, widely through the Department's social media accounts. So, as their members, for your information. Thank you. Item three. There's the update on counter-terrorism sentencing and release bill. Um, 
pages 3 to 15 of your table pack, the Department provided a further update on the position in respect of this issue. The Minister recently um, written to the Lord Chancellor, Secretary of State for Justice, following further correspondence and information that indicated a change of approach in the UK Government's decision to apply retrospectively provisions within the Terrorist Defenders um, Act 2020 to remove the automatic right to early release within Northern Ireland. The Minister has indicated to the Lord Chancellor that she does not consider these provisions should be applied retrospectively um, and is of the view that the decision is likely to lead to potentially serious operational difficulties. She does welcome the fact that mandatory polygraph testing within post-release licence conditions will not be reduced in Northern Ireland unless requested uh, by the Assembly. And the Minister will provide a further update to the Committee once details from the Ministry of Justice on the final provisions of the Westminster Bill are known. And she has also requested clarification from the Lord Chancellor regarding whether an LCM is considered necessary. So, members, I am seeking um, agreement to ask the Department for a copy of the Lord Chancellor's um, and Secretary of State for Justice's letter, which is dated 24 uh, April, setting out the background to and rationale uh, behind the Government's decision to change its approach from the Department of Justice uh, to assist our Committee's consideration of the matter. Obviously, members, it raises issues that you will want to look at, but we need to have more information uh, to have a proper debate around it. So. If we're content, we'll seek that information and we will come back to this issue. Okay. Item four, um, the debate on the LCM. The debate on the LCM on private international law uh, bill is listed on the order paper for Tuesday the 19th, um, indicatively starting at 12.30 uh, p.m. Just uh, for members' information. Um, we've covered the uh, briefing with the Attorney General, which was item four. Item five is the uh, domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, the motion to extend committee stage, um, pages 148 to 151 of your meeting pack. Uh, committee stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill commenced on the 29th of April, and the 30 working day period provided under standing orders for completion of committee stage is due to finish on the 11th of June. Standing orders provide that before conclusion of the 30 working days, a motion may be made uh, in the Assembly by the Chairman of the Committee or the Deputy Chair um, on his or her behalf to extend the period of the Committee stage, and the motion must specify a date to which the Committee stage will be extended. The Committee considered and agreed a timetable for the Committee stage of the Bill at the meeting on 30 April, based on an extension of the Committee stage until 15 October. Uh, this year to reflect the wish of the committee to undertake robust scrutiny of the bill whilst n taking no longer than considered necessary. A draft motion to extend to this date has therefore been prepared for consideration. So, If members are content, um, a motion will be lodged that states the following, in that in accordance with Standing Order 33-4, the period referred to in Standing Order 33-2, be extended to 15 October 2020 in relation to the committee stage of the domestic abuse and family uh, proceedings Bill. Uh, so, members, I request that the debate on the motion would be scheduled for the first or the second of June. If members are content, we'll proceed on that basis. Yes, I am Linda. content with it. There's no no issue to that at all. Um, I suppose just to reiterate, and I know we had we outlined the reasons why you wouldn't sit during the summer recess because it's going to be helpful to the clerks, and I wouldn't want to do anything that's going to put any extra additional pressure on you, given the pressure that obviously everybody is already under. But if, if at any point it is seen that a, a meeting of the committee would be helpful rather than to create any further difficulties or, or workload, I certainly would be um, prepared to do that. I'm sure most committee members probably would be as well. Yeah. It's, the, the offer stands if, it, if it's something that's seen as necessary, but certainly not something that would create a further workload un, uh, unnecessarily. Yeah. No, well, if, if we need to do it, we will do it, you know, and, and we'll, we'll work around Thank you. the committee to do that. But um, it's certainly it's available to us if we need to, to do that. Okay. I think we'll have a better idea when we see the volume of, uh -huh. of what comes back and yeah. the issues that are being raised. Just how long it will take. So. June will be very busy for the committee. It'll be at least once a week. Okay. Item six. Um, is the LCM on the sentencing bill, the draft committee report, um, pages 153 to 159. Um, just 
in, in terms of typographical or, or formatting errors in the report will be amended at the proofing stage before it's circulated to MLAs and published um, on the committee web page. Um, so if members uh, are content the draft report, then it will be produced. Um, I will go through the relevant questions then. Members, if you just bear with me, it needs to be done. Um, front page, if uh, I could put the question, are members content that the front page, contents page and membership page stand part of the report? Agreed. Um, on background, are members content that the background section of paragraphs 1 to 4 stand part of the report? Um, yeah. Are members content that paragraph 5, which outlines the purpose of the legislative consent motion, stands part of the report? Agreed. Are members content that paragraphs 6 to 9, which detail the committee's consideration of the legislative consent motion, stand part of the report? Agreed. And are members content that the conclusion section of paragraph 10 stand part of the report? Agreed. Agreed. Are members content that the appendices stand part of the report? Agreed. Agreed. Members, um, if you're content that I'll clear the draft minutes of this meeting for inclusion in Appendix 2, and that will en enable the report to be finalised, the draft minutes will then be replaced by the final version of the minutes when these are agreed by uh, the committee, if members are content with that approach. Agreed. And again, if members are content that the report be published on the committee's web page and issued to all MLAs. Agreed. Agreed. And the committee staff uh, will notify members when a date for the debate on the LCM has been scheduled. Thank you. Item 7. Um, at our meeting on the 2nd of April, the committee considered and agreed handling arrangements for a range of work items in light of the current exceptional circumstances. In relation to the proposed LCM on the Birmingham Commonwealth Games Bill, the committee agreed to consider the written briefing paper and submit any questions or requests for further information or clarity to the Department's uh, response. Depending on the issues raised and timing of the LCM, consideration would then be given if an oral briefing was required. The Birmingham Commonwealth Games Bill includes creation of an offence which prohibits the unauthorised sale or resale of tickets to ensure that they are affordable and accessible whilst preventing criminal activity and protecting the brand and reputation of the Games. The offence and penalties are within the legislative competence of the Assembly and the Department is proposing to extend these to Northern Ireland by way of an LCM motion. Um, Further information was requested on the position around uh, the Department of Economy, given its responsibility on, for enforcement. The Department has confirmed that the Economy Department has no difficulty with the enforcement rule for sale of tickets for the Games in Northern <coughs> Ireland and has not expressed any concerns regarding the proposed offence and penalties. The Department has indicated that it expects to, to uh, lay the LCM on uh, by the 15th of May. The 15-day timescale provided by standing orders for the committee to complete scrutiny of this LCM and agree its report will then start, and therefore a decision on whether an oral briefing or any further information is needed to assist scrutiny of the LCM is required at this meeting. So, members, it's just to seek uh, your approval that you're content with the proposal to extend these provisions for the Birmingham Commonwealth Games Bill that creates this offence to prohibit unauthorised sale or resale of tickets and the associated penalties to Northern Ireland um, through the use of the LCM. Agreed. Agreed. I'm content. Agreed. Okay. Well, then we will indicate that we're content to proceed without the need for an oral briefing, and the information provided has been suffice to facilitate the committee. Thank you. Item 8. Um, the Department is proposing to extend provisions relating to unlawful use of drones near custodial institutions in the Air Traffic Management and Unmanned Aircraft Bill to Northern Ireland by way of an LCM. Um, the Bill will amend the Police Act 1997, uh, allowing senior Northern Ireland Prison Service and Youth Justice Agency staff rather than senior police officers to receive applications and authorise their respective staff to interfere with a drone where it will prevent or detect a relevant offence as defined by the Prison Act of 1953, including in assisting an escape or conveying unauthorised articles such as controlled drugs and mobile phones into a place of detention, and this will allow rapid action against real-time drone incidents. Um, while the use of drones in Northern Ireland around places of detention has to date been rare, the Department is keen to take the opportunity presented by the Bill to future-proof against a potential rise in this type of drone activity. So, members, it's to seek your view as to whether you're content with the proposal to extend these provisions in the Air Traffic Management and Unmanned Aircraft Bill 
um, to allow senior prison service staff and youth agency uh, officials to authorise counter drone measures in relation to the unlawful use of drones near custodial sentence settings um, by way of this LCM, or whether an oral briefing or um, further information is required. I'd like to know how the what's the counter measures. <laughs> Why did they take them out? <laughs> In principle, I'm, I agree with what they're what they're doing. But um, the, are members content to uh, give our consent to the LCM approach? Then agreed. 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 Um, item nine. At our meeting on the 9th of April, the committee agreed it was consent with the proposal for a statutory rule to amend the police training regulations, uh, providing the Chief Constable greater flexibility regarding the attestation and deployment of police trainees to meet potential resourcing uh, demand during the COVID-19 pandemic. That rule, was, uh, uh, which is subject to negative resolution procedure, it was laid on the 15th of April, also, uh, although it was made and came into operation on the 10th of April. The Department has confirmed that there has been no change to policy content since the SL1 was considered by the Committee. Um, the examiner of stat rules has drawn attention to the breach of the 21-day rule by the Department. The examiner has noted the Department's explanation for the breach and is content uh, that the urgent response to the impact of Novit. Uh, COVID-19 outbreak is satisfactory as a reason for the breach. So, if members are content, I'll formally put the question that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2020 forward slash 65, the Police Trainee Regulations 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Agreed. 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 Item 10: The Department proposes to amend the same household rule within. The Northern Ireland Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme 2009. The amendment will allow victims of a crime between the 1st of March 1969 and the 30th of June of 1988, living as a member of the same household as their assailant, uh, to apply for criminal injury compensation. The amendment to the scheme is subject to approval by the Assembly by affirmative resolution. Um, just to advise members that are present, same household victims are able to claim under the 2009 scheme from the 1st of July 1998 onwards, but under paragraph 7 of that scheme, victims before that date remain ineligible. And it was in a judgment on a judicial review that was delivered on the 23rd of November 2018. The Court of Appeal in Northern Ireland concluded that the same household bar was not justified in law, and the Department accepted that ruling. The Department believes that there will be widespread support across the Assembly for this amendment, and the benefit of conducting a, consult a consultation exercise would be negligible. Um, estimations suggest that there could be 800 applicants. And based on this, there could be a potential 10-year cost of between 10 to 18.5 million pounds for this change. So, if members are content with this proposed amendment to the criminal just uh, criminal injuries compensation scheme, then we can indicate um, as being content without the need for further information. Content. Yes. Yeah. Okay, item 11. Officials from um, Legal Services Agency and the Department attended the committee on the 23rd of April outlining proposals for the COVID-19 interim payment scheme for legal aid suppliers. Following the evidence session, the committee agreed, given current circumstances, that it was content with the general thrust of the scheme and would support uh, it proceeding. The committee also asked officials to provide results of the consultation and details of the final scheme. The Department has provided those results of the targeted consultation on the proposals and details of the final interim payment scheme for legal aid suppliers. The Department did make um, a number of changes to the scheme as a result of that process, including increases to a range of fees. In criminal cases, these increases also take account of the PPS proposed interim fee arrangements in Crown Court cases, and the interim scheme came into effect on the 7th of May. So, if members are content to note the results of this consultation and the post consultation changes uh, to the scheme, are members content? content. Yeah. Forward work program. Um, the program includes several work items requested by the department. Um, it <coughs> provides for three or four meetings to take oral evidence on the domestic abuse and family proceedings bill in accordance with the bill timetable. Proposals for the oral evidence sessions on the bill will be presented to the committee uh, to consider before the end of this month, and, and uh, an update. Uh, briefings on COVID-19 situation and just related issues will be scheduled when necessary, as will further consideration of LCMs. So, members, it's there for you to note in terms of the forward work programme for May and June, unless there's more information needed by members. We're agreed to note it. Um, 
Yesterday, the Department sent through a list of further work items that the Minister and officials consider to be pressing and urgent, and on which they would like progress to be made ahead of the summer recess. That was on page 21 of your table pack. Um, just to remind members, at the beginning of April, the Committee did write to the Minister asking the Department to avoid bringing non-essential items of business to the Committee, if possible, until regular Committee business resumed, given the current circumstances and the need to focus on COVID-19 related work and other essential business, such as legislation, when the Committee uh, does meet. So, members, I am going to suggest um, that just before we agree to schedule these additional items, that we write and ask the Minister to detail the criteria that the Department is using to assess uh, what, is, what is deemed urgent and essential. Um, for a list of the items of business that the, the uh, department, sorry, and to also ask for a list of items that the department is currently holding back from the committee um, uh, before normal business is uh, resumed. I just think it's important that we know um, what the criteria is that the department are using that they deem to be um, essential um, business that needs to be required. Uh, what may be provided in this list may be uh, indeed essential, but um, I think. We need to see the criteria and that that is being assessed against and what business is not coming forward. And I think that will help members. Um, obviously, we want to facilitate uh, the department and to work with them in partnership. Um, but uh, it would be good to know the criteria that they're basing their decisions on. If members are content, we'll write asking for that. Item 13, correspondence. There's four items um, of correspondence in the, in the meeting pack and one that has been tabled. Um, I'll just highlight a couple of them. Item 3 is a response from the police, providing further information that the Chief Constable agreed to give during the oral evidence session on the 13th of February. Um, members are asked to note that response unless further information is required. Uh, item 4 was correspondence from Mr Little, which uh, has been sent to all committee members regarding the role, authority and legal backing of the new mental health champion will have. Mr Little has provided a copy of that letter that he has sent to the Minister for Justice and Health and is asking the committee to scrutinise the actions that the Justice Minister takes in this regard. So, if members are content, we will request a copy of the Minister's response uh, to Mr Little, and that will enable the committee to consider in future. Item 5 was a Centre for Justice Innovation briefing document highlighting themes for information that has been collated on how the justice systems around the world have responded to COVID-19, and it is there for members' information. If members are content, we will action the correspondence then outlined in the clerk's memo. I have no chairman's business. Is there any other business? If not, um, the next meeting of the committee is planned to take place on Thursday, the 28th of May, unless essential business requires an earlier meeting. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.